Are you ready to manage your work and personal world better to live a fulfilling, productive life? Then you've come to the right place. Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity. Here are your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud, with Francis Wade and Art Gelwix. Hello, and welcome to Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things personal productivity. I'm Ray Sidney Smith. And I'm Augusto Pinot. I'm Francis Weed. And I'm Mark Gelwix. Welcome, gentlemen, and welcome to our listeners to today's episode. Today, we are doing our second book cast, book discussions on books that we are reading, and we wanted to share what we are reading with you. Today, we are discussing The Myth of Multitasking, How Doing It All Gets Nothing Done, the second edition by Dan Crenshaw. He has written several books on productivity, but most notably, he has written and produced several courses on lynda.com, now known as LinkedIn Learning, and that is the Microsoft-owned company, LinkedIn, LinkedIn Learning, and the lynda.com platform. So if you ever go to LinkedIn Learning or lynda.com and you look at any of the productivity courses there, they're likely done by Dan Crenshaw. And so he has written this book, this, do we call this an allegory or a fable of Helen and Phil, Phil being a productivity consultant that has come into this company to help out Green Garb with their productivity, specifically the CEO, Helen. What did you guys think of the book? What were your ideas that initially kind of after finishing the book you thought about? And then we can get into the kind of particulars of, of what Phil is really trying to portray here, what Crenshaw is trying to portray here through the character of Phil. You know, the book was really enjoyable. I agree on on the issues of multitasking and the problems of lack of attention and lack of focus. So um, I, I think for many people who think that they can be to certain degrees effective multitasking, it's important to understand what Crusher call background tasking, you know, that you can drive and listen music and uh, versus actually when you need to put attention on the work and what is the cost of not putting the right attention to these, to these tasks. He did attempt to bring a couple of new definitions to the world. I have frequently called what he was calling back tasking or background tasking as metatasking. That is something that is layered uh, and background or back tasking just didn't seem right to me as the right term. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, and so the idea of kind of habit stacking or these other terms that tend to muddle what is actually happening is, I think, counter to my own productivity. When I think about it in those terms, they just don't make sense. If we are doing two tasks at once, one that doesn't require our full attention and can be done either by a machine or simultaneously, like having a conversation and driving while not as not the safest thing in the world can be done or texting and driving, which is not safe and should not be done. Right? There, are, there are different standards of what can be done. And so this idea of back tasking or background tasking just didn't seem to stick with me as a term. But I recognize that it happens, that we do it, and that it can actually be a very useful mechanism for time management. The concept of backtasking to me is a rationalization within the book. I mean, it, it's talking about pushing something to an alternative system. Let's say you've got a video that you've edited and it needs to render. So you're going to let the system render while you take some calls. That's fine, but you're not doing the work. And that's where I think it becomes a misnomer and, and it actually undermines this whole concept of getting away from multitasking because we're talking about something else going on but you're not actually doing it. So why even kid yourself that you're doing it? You're starting something off and running. This is delegation. You just happen to be delegating to an automated system. So I don't know. I, I think it's an unnecessary addition and it, and it clutters the concept. Yeah, I think you could take the example of doing laundry while watching a television show. So there is a facilitated part here, which is that the washer machine and the dryer are going to do the bulk majority of the work. But say that you're folding your clothes or putting your clothes on hangers while watching the show. That's where you are. In essence, you have your attention primarily on one activity where you're consuming mm -hmm. something while still being able to do the other activity, which is folding the clothes. I don't differentiate the fact that a machine is doing some level of the work. Like you said, you know, if you have a video rendering and you go and do something else, you're still having to manage. If you're, if you're managing the activity, then I consider you doing it. And so that's kind of how I've 
piece those two pieces together. So I, it's interesting because you're you're differentiating that which is machine facilitated work mm. and that you, that you're managing and action based work that you're actually doing yourself manually. That's an interesting delineation. See, but I would also challenge the the idea the consuming example because to me there's a difference between active and passive consuming. And if you are doing something like folding your laundry, you're passively consuming whatever it is that you know is on the TV because for periods of time, be ever they how short, you have to disconnect from that to make sure you actually fold the thing in front of you. So for that block of time, you're not engaged. You're not doing that other thing, which is that passive absorption of whatever's going on. You're not taking notes. You're not capturing details. You're not processing the information. It's just kind of floating in the background. So, and I find myself doing the same thing. If I'm working on a project and I decide, oh, I'll play an audio book while I'm doing this too. It doesn't take me very long to recognize the fact that I'm getting very little value out of that audio book at that point, because I'm not focused on that. It's background. It's, yeah, I might absorb something, but it's not an effective use of the dual task. If I, if I want value out of something, it requires focus. And that's, again, this is where I struggle with this a little bit because it does make sense to me to take things that do not require my focus and I do not need to drive personal engagement to get the value out of to some other thing, whether mechanical, personal, or otherwise, but simultaneously doing things, it just does flat out doesn't work. I mean, his definite, his reference to what often we refer to as time slicing, you know, jumping back and forth between things, I think is a much more accurate representation of this. With that, I'm going to I'm going to snap us back to the beginning of the book and <laughs> let's start from the beginning of the book, which is it is called The Myth of Multitasking and we we find Phil in this narrative where he is a productivity consultant and he comes and meets Helen the CEO of Green Garb. And as he is introduced to her, she is harried and dealing with, you know, multiple people in her office and finally makes time to sit down with Phil. And then they are capable of having a conversation about her current time and task management. And what did you think? Let's just start at the very top of the chart in terms of multitasking as he defined it the idea of multitasking generally, how we've considered it and thought about it in society and work culture over the past several decades, because it is a fairly new invention. And we can kind of go from there. You know, there's a there's a story here. So let's stick to the narrative and we can kind of make our way through the different pieces perhaps. But what did you think about the presentation of the material of multitasking? And I'll just start with the fact that he basically posits that multitasking is a myth because it is what we call switch tasking. Switch tasking is a mechanism by which we're never doing two things at once. Uh, the brain has to switch back and forth between those two things. And because we have to switch back and forth between those two things, he uses the parallel concept in in accounting. In business accounting or business management, we talk about switching cost, which is that if you wanted to switch vendors, switch systems, say that you wanted to move from, say, one ERP system to another, there's a switching cost. That is, you need to change the software that may include training, it may include moving uh, the data, it may include any number of things that re that requires costs for the business to be able to do that. And he uses that concept to relate to how our brains have to switch back and forth between those two activities. And so he presents multitasking as a myth. It's not new to us, no. Back when he wrote the book in 2008, I think it was newer. But But now we know that Cognitive attention. It, it's not the doing in this general sense. We we now know the science is, is is out there that it's the cognitive attention that we can't split. That's the it's not the walking and chewing gum. You know, we, we can do your body is doing all kinds of things. You know, the four of us are here recording this episode and our bodies are doing all kinds of things, our brains are doing all kinds of things. But the the scarce resource that we have is our cognitive attention. And that's what that's the maybe the finding that's become more apparent since he wrote this book. It's not doing anything. Like this morning, for example, I listened to a podcast while I was doing my weightlifting workout. So essentially, my weightlifting workout requires no doesn't require any cognitive attention because I'm basically going through a habitual routine. It's an autopilot. 
So I don't need to give it. I didn't do anything different. I didn't try to innovate. I, I just went through the motions. So I could listen to the podcast while doing it because I'm doing a physical activity. I'm not splitting my cognitive attention. Um, and the same goes for walking with somebody and having a deep conversation. Walking doesn't interfere because you're not splitting your cognitive attention. The problem with driving and texting is that it's splitting. Talking to somebody else while trying to read a book, um, watching a video while trying to write a paper. All of those are, are involved splits of cognitive attention. And that's the, that's the core the core scarce resource that we need to focus on. All the other stuff, I think, is just neither here nor there if they don't require cognitive attention. So he's the protagonist. He's helping Helen throughout you know, get over these problems that she's having. She's been splitting her cognitive attention all kinds of ways and trying to divide it into small bits and pieces here and there. And another thing we know is that if you don't spend time getting into the flow state with your cognitive attention at its highest, then you won't ever be at your most productive. You, you, you just won't. It takes 20 minutes to get to the point where you can be in the flow state, according to um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And um, if you don't spend that time, if you never spend that time to get into the flow state, then your cognitive attention will never be at its best or its best use. So in the book, she split, she was splitting, you know, her attention every three, four or five minutes and then wondering why nothing was getting, nothing productive was getting done. And he explains it saying that it's switch tasking and there's a cost to doing that. And he gives her a little exercise. I've done the same exercise in my live trainings as well. And the results are always hilarious where you, I, I ask people to, recite the alphabet and then count from one to 26 and then I time them and then I ask them to do okay no go from z to or even a to z but if it worse from z to a um, and then intersperse the numbers between them and that's when it slows down it's always slow and people are always amazed by it I'll give the contrarian view to this, which first starting at the fact that what is considered muscle memory, but just consider it well-worn paths, the brain takes less energy when it knows what it's doing already by virtue of it doing it over and over again. So we are the patterns we repeat. So the idea of, say, driving the same route every day. So for example, I had the same route to work for a decade, and I drove that route every day. So if someone was trying to to murder me, <laughs> they would have known exactly where to, to set up shop and to assassinate me at any given time in that 10 years. That meant that if I was listening to an audiobook or if I was listening to a podcast on the way to work, my physical being, that is my entire alert system, was on autopilot. And if something changed in my environment my brain would kick into gear, you know, if a car cut me off, or if something out of the ordinary happened, I would be immediately able to recognize that that's, you know, your limbic system in play. And you would be able to then course correct quickly, that left the rest of my cognitive ability to experience whatever I wanted to auditorily, you know, whatever, while I was working um, in the car. And you know, within limitation, of course, because you want to be safe, that kind of thing. But most of mine was consuming and uh, taking aud audible notes. So I would, you know, trigger my phone to take notes. And it allowed me to be able to drive and consume lots and lots of material over the over the course of that time. What we forget is that if you told me to write a one B two C three over and over and over again for decades, then I would become really good at that, and the switching cost would no longer be a cost. So the more we do something, the more repeated activity we do, the better we get at it. And this sometimes ends up being the argument against uh, multitasking that multitasking can be done. But what we really are saying is that ad hoc action cannot be done in non-focused time without a switching cost. So we have to recognize that there is always a switching cost if we are doing activities that are not the same things we do all the time. If they're not automatic, 
you know, habitual, as you noted before, Francis, then automaticity doesn't give us the reduced cognitive load that we need to be able to make that happen. But if you do need to do two things at once, then you need to really turn that into a habit. You need to really turn that into some kind of automatic behavior that then settles your brain into automatic mode for one part of it so that you can give most of your attention to the other thing. And I would imagine that in probably the next 100,000 years, humans will probably be able to do more and more of this kind of uh, multimodal thinking. Uh, I really do think that ultimately, you know, we're thinking creatures and we will probably evolve in that direction. But until that time comes, <laughs> we cannot and we are, uh, we are limited uh, by our biology and we should take best effect of what we know about it. So there is a switching cost for these activities that we are doing ad hoc and we need to, we need to um, take best advantage of being productive in that. So Phil argues that focused work, that, that I differentiate between two different things, flow work and focus work. In the Chingseng Mihai world, Dr. Chingseng Mihai, uh, as you noted earlier, Francis, he talks about this idea of being uh, in this deep space, caught up in the moment, kind of like, you know, you're caught up in the river and the tide of whatever's happening. That kind of work is one type of work. Focused action work is where you're doing actions that you are switching between because you are moving back and forth between things, but you have them say on a list and you're, you're checking off those items down a list, maybe project oriented also, where you're maybe Maybe calling someone, then emailing someone, then doing something, but it's in, within a context. I know I was saying that I was giving the devil's advocate view, but really I was reinforcing Francis's argument. Well, and I think that's that's one of the important distinctions is what is the kind of activities you are tasking. You multitask on some of those activities that require what when one requires zero brain power versus the other one require, maybe. Can you the problem is not that, and this is where I'm coming to disagree with Francis. Yes, in theory. We all know this. In the practice, as pressure increased and you know, pandemic came up, people forget this. And you see people in, you know, and, and we discussed this on, on an episode before, people in two or three Zoom calls or meets or, or teams or whatever at the same time in two machines, paying attention to none of them and believing that they are effectively multitasking to all these meetings where really in reality they are not present on any of them uh it is the same thing we have seen you know one, one of the things i i love in that it goes when when on the, on the book is when ask how much you work well and then the math works something like 190 hours a week well uh, you know kind of challenging <laughs> okay <laughs> when we only have 165 but the reality is that is 168, sorry. Uh, when the reality is that's what most people believe. If you ask most people, that's what they believe. And the, what happened is that difference between 190, 200 versus minus 168, that's the amount you are present nowhere. Because you think you're present everywhere. And the reality then is you're present nowhere. So what were some of the training interventions, I would call them behavioral interventions, that Phil proposed to Helen? And it was kind of on two levels, because one was he focused on Helen because she was the leader of the organization. And I very much agree in this particular case that having, in this particular case, a hierarchical system where you have a pyramid of order, you work with the leader, and then the leader models and then you're capable of training downstream to the rest of the organization, especially in a smaller organization where the leader creates the culture by virtue of their example. And that frequently has a lot of the, the development work of the people either following the primary leader or leadership within the organization. What do you think about the message that Phil kind of presented, which is that you should work with the leader first in an organization and help them develop before you, you start helping the people below? I don't think you start it just at one level. I think you have to attack that problem from both ends. Um, a lot of times that <clears throat> those drivers, and I want to back up to a thought that I had earlier, multitasking 
with the misnomer is most commonly, at least what I've seen, reaction. It's a reaction to an environment you do not have control over. You have work influences coming in, you have workload and work streams coming in, and you are reacting to those to try and manage these parallel streams. Um, Often, leadership is responsible for the cause for those parallel streams, but also other members of your organization, whether at your own level or below. And it is just as important to tackle it at that level as well. Uh, There's a part in the book where they're talking about um, Helen and Phil are meeting and Sally pokes her head in to ask a question and actually gets all bent out of shape because Helen won't answer the question right then because she's, Helen has established that as as a behavior that's acceptable to interrupt her to get answers. Uh, The problem is Sally has also accepted that as an acceptable behavior. And anyone within these environments, leadership needs to empower their personnel to be able to say, you know what, that's not a good habit. That's not a good process to be in. Uh, You shouldn't be interrupting. You shouldn't be driving. You should be cognizant and coherent around people's availability. But we don't do that. We have common objectives to say, okay, we need to get this done by this date and time, come hell or high water. Well, that's fine, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be done well then. And I personally, I think it has to be tackled from not only at the leadership level who needs to set the example, but at the grassroots level where the reinforcement and the willingness to say, no, I'm going to follow this new set of standards, regardless of what you want to push on me needs to come into play as well. I think the book did give that illustration well. I just don't think they, I don't think he did a good job of empowering Sally in that context to say, you know what, I'm just not going to go interrupt her. Yeah, the, 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 I think there's a bit of a simple assumption that what would happen next is that Helen would evangelize the idea to everyone around her and they would pick it up just because she's the one in charge and because she's the one who's saying it. I, I think that's what you're, you're hinting at, Art. It's, that it's not as simple as that. I've, I've just not seen, I've never, never been in a client company and seen the simple idea that the book presents implemented on a large scale. And I hope you guys have, because I'm hoping that there are counter examples out there. But most organizations grew, have grown into you know, Rube Goldberg devices that really don't work. That's when it, when it comes to my, my working with you, my colleagues in the same company, we are just not on the same page in the sense that we have a thought through way of being productive that we all agree on, that we've all received similar exposure, similar training. We're all developing our practices. We're all continuously improving them. Mm-hmm. Um, we're trying to become more productive in this one way. So this is just one way of being productive with each other, let alone email and all the others, which are a whole nother problem. And I've not, I've not heard of a clear cut case where a company has, I've heard talk of it. So I've heard it mentioned. I've not seen a company say we've done it for five years or two years even And this is how we did it. And here's how we made the journey from everyone doing their own thing and to norms that were just inappropriate and weren't thought through and just happened by accident. How do we get from there to where we're in? We're all in sync with each other. I've not seen it. I hope it exists because the the things I see now are, oh, yeah, we all have an open door policy. Oh, yeah, we all have we, we all believe in open open de- open open space or open seating where everybody's in a one big room mm-hmm. um oh we, we, whenever something is important the boss needs to forget importance the boss needs to interrupt whoever he wants that works for him in order to get them to do things immediately regardless of what they were working on before that's the default mm-hmm. there's no other there's no other practice in their mind that says let me see if it might be a courtesy, but that's more of a point of etiquette than it is a productivity principle. So I've not seen, I, I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear you guys give me some examples of places you've actually seen this happening, but this is one of those things that just seems to fall through the cracks because no one is responsible for it. So therefore, 
the worst practices take over and they run the show and everybody shrugs their shoulders. They hate it, but. I think you just called out one of the best examples of saying one do one thing and doing something completely different. And that's that myth of the open door policy, you know, executives. Oh, I have an open door policy. Anybody can come in at any time. Yeah. You have just created your own interrupt driven nightmare. And you have now demonstrated that to the rest of the organization that that is expect that is how they are expected to behave. Well, now if you're going to complain that you get interrupted all the time, guess what, dude, you did this to yourself. So understanding the context and the repercussions of this. Yeah. So many organizations, they talk a good game. They lay something out. They'll maybe they'll stick to it for a year or two until the next idea comes out in a book published somewhere and some executive gets a hold of it and says, now we're going to change to this way of, of working. It just, it doesn't work only from the top down. Like I said, it has to be absorbed across the organization. What's the classic statement? The first step to solving a problem is knowing it exists. Well, the entire organization has to recognize that there's a problem. I mean, I've been in, in groups and on teams where For some reason, meetings, for example, spiral wildly out of control and you wind up with literally 25 meetings in the course of a week. That's just insanity. And when you look back at those meetings and you realize that you're talking about the same thing in five different meetings and four of those have the same people in them, it's a craziness level because out of each one of those, more work comes and the expectation is you'll be doing that work while you do the meeting work, you will be multitasking. It doesn't work. It's just a complete fallacy. And anybody who tries to sell that has got a bridge for sale as well. So I look at it from the standpoint, organizations talk a good game with this, but the change happens at, at the local level. I and mean, you know, like they say about government, you know, you think globally, but you act locally. That's exactly what happens. This change happens within teams. It happens between individuals and colleagues. It happens within divisions. Um, Google is not going to say, Tim Cook is not going to say, this is how we're going to operate. And the next day, that is how they're going to operate. No, Steve Jobs was not going to be able to do that. He'd love to to tout he would. Elon Musk is going to say, yeah, this is how we do. No, it's not. Don't tell me it is because you know it's not. When you dig down into the organization itself, that is not how you're functioning. So when we look at this type of a book and this type of content, it brings to light truly this myth, this fallacy of how this type of work happens and how we manage our work. But I think the best illustration of the entire thing is that this is all about personal responsibility. It is responsive, being responsible to the work that you are committing to deliver. And we keep talking about productivity and we keep talking about productivity. And I've really had to rethink this a lot lately. I think it's about effectiveness. I can be productive. I can say, yeah, I delivered eight things this week all at the same time. Guess what? They were all garbage because they weren't, I wasn't nearly as effective in doing them because I didn't provide them the focus and the concentration that they needed. But I still can tick those boxes. I've met those SLAs. Well, that's great. But Was I effective? And that, I think that's the thing to take out of this is that the the habits and the behaviors we have currently, whether they're individually or at an organizational level, are not effective. It's rare that you find effective ones. You find lots of methodologies, but you don't find truly effective implementations of them. And I think that's where I started to struggle with the book a little bit later on is because, again, we have this, hey, we found the problem. Yeah, but that's great. Now what? I'll give the flip side to this, which is that I deal with a lot of micro businesses. And so the small business, I think, world is maybe perhaps a little bit different than larger businesses. And that I am capable of meeting businesses at the very early stages of their in, of their creation. And that allows me a little bit more latitude with those business owners. The same thing kind of applies in the in the small organization world where I, I've, I've worked with executives now in companies of many different sizes all the way up to, you know, much larger organizations. But the, but the ones in which I've had greatest effect with have been the ones that have 
some level of autonomy within a larger organization or they're much smaller organizations. And there are kind of two different people here. I think I agree with you, Art, that the the people who are, say, at the bottom of the pyramid, if we want to use a hierarchical group or organization, which not all organizations are now hierarchical, but um, let's presume that there's still a pyramid involved. But the the way in which I found it is to find an advocate inside who is as close to the middle or or near to the bottom as possible, someone who's really wedded to that material, and then find someone at the top or a group of people at the top. And that allows us to be able to drive the message from, from both ends. If you have these internal advocates of your message along with the leadership team also bought in, then mm-hmm. training those two I found to be most effective because then it kind of starts to spread amongst the right people. The nearest to the leadership are going to start to uh, absorb that message or that content. And then the people at the middle to bottom of the pyramid are going to start to spread that message very quickly, especially if you start to see results from those people. It becomes more organic than not. And so just like planting seeds, you just have to plant a lot of them in order for people to start to germinate these ideas. And my goal is never for an entire organization to adhere to anything. Uh, That is, like democracy, it is messy, and it takes constant nurturing, and it's virtually impossible to get everybody on the same page. The goal is to get enough people that the organization changes. If we can have a, a shift in the organization's outcomes, then I consider that effective. I consider the effectiveness of the organization to be the thing that I'm working toward. It's not the effectiveness of any one individual. So I think about it in that sense, like I can't get everyone to do this. I guess the other side to this, instead of like a Rube Goldberg machine, as you noted, Francis, I'm thinking of this as bricolage, right? People just need to take whatever they have and build together the best bailing wire and duct tape structure that they can in the organization to get things done. It's more inviting more people to be MacGyver, if you understand that reference, than to be uh, someone who is just a skilled productivity enthusiast. But if if they can figure out how their system that includes uh, post-its and, you know, stickies on their desktop, you know, app, the stickies app on Microsoft or whatever, and, you know, Google Calendar, if they can make that work, with their system, then great. Now, I have the kind of interesting world where I'm coming in to any organization because of technology. People are are wanting me to help them invest in a specific type of technology. So I'm usually capable of inserting myself in one category and then saying, but you know that you could really do so much more across many different categories. And and that really helps um, create an inroad that allows leadership and staff to to think more broadly about what their capabilities are and more broadly about what my capabilities are for them. So I think it all ends up being how you introduce a concept. You have to start slowly. And I think Phil did that here in the myth of multitasking. He started off slowly with one person. It's a small organization that seems to be growing. And he tried to just kind of get this one person kind of around it and then did more training for more of the people. It's of course textbook. Like that's the thing I thought about the book. It was like everything was so pristine and perfect in the book, right? There was no real, there was no great conflict. There was no great problems that occurred. Everything was exactly as it should have been. And that's a very quaint concept today uh, that everything just works out. I, I understand the message, right? He wanted to very much like Dr. Ken Blanchard's books and that kind of thing. There's a clear message that's being narrated. And so there isn't a need to put in the challenges unless those challenges are teaching a lesson about how to overcome them. And so I, I appreciated that about the book, even though it wasn't the most convincing it wasn't a Harry Potter. It wasn't a, <laughs> a Lord of the Rings type of, of conflict, you know, hero journey message, but it definitely uh, conveyed the messages that we needed to. Anything else about the myth of multitasking that popped out for you? And who would you recommend this book for? That's a hard one because the, the premise of it is applicable to pretty much anybody who would read it. I mean, that's, there's, truths to be found for anyone who's trying to do any work. Um, I think the people who would probably benefit the most from it, though, may not recognize that fact. And it would be 
leaders and team, you know, project managers and tech leads and all of those different types of roles who are helping set a tone, but not necessarily at like the sea level of an organization The that I hate the term middle management person is the one who can set that framework up, but they have to recognize that one, there is a problem and two, they are substantially responsible for solving that problem. Uh, it's tough because you're handing somebody a book to say, hey, guess what? You have this issue. You just don't know it. Go read this, figure out, admit that to yourself, and then go fix it. And not everybody takes that too well. So I would, I would recommend you know, anybody who, had, who working with themselves or at least one other person, if not more, there will be valuable stuff that comes out of here. The hang up is, is this is the type of thing that it's easy to backslide. You can make progress for three months, four months, six months, but I can immediately see you backsliding into old bad habits very quickly, just depending on the the nature of work often. If you have a type of work that is very interrupt driven, well, guess what? You're going to wind up slipping back into this if you are not fastidious and diligent about preventing that from happening. So the book's a good start, but it's literally just a start in my, in my estimation. I think the book was great for 2008 when it first came out. I don't think it has the same cachet or relevance is a kind of a strong word, but it, things have changed, you know, in the last 13 years. We, we all know, know that texting and driving. So that's not, that's not a revelation. We all know that multitasking while doing certain things is bad. We, we all know that if you're trying to be in a Zoom call, you shouldn't be on Facebook. COVID has accelerated some of that because people's workplaces have changed. They've gone from working in the office where they could be more focused to trying to work at home where the, the dog is yapping and the kids are crying and, and there's multiple tugs on your attention at any one time. I think it's going to happen again once people go back to the office. They're going to notice, for example, that maybe I could focus at home where I, maybe I was alone at home and I got a whole lot done. No, I'm back in the office. I'm getting nothing done. I think the message, the core message, I'd be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't know the core message of the book today. I, don't, I, don't, I think it's, it's understood. It's accepted. What's not accepted is a part art was pointing out, which is, okay, you may individually accept it and that may be very nice, but you may put someone who is, who is the most devoted unitasker on the planet the person who uses the flow state the most effectively you put them in a bad organization and <laughs> they're gonna conform so fast that <laughs> they they will be able to spell multitasking after a couple of months in that environment and people quit as a result but the the system that they're in is way more powerful than their personal habit patterns convictions knowledge experience awareness even if they're the CEO, the chairman, the, the whatever, if there's no agreement around them for, for the principles in the book, then, and, and, and it's already spent, you know, they've spent years going in the opposite direction, then they have all the challenges that Art talked about. And the book, the book is great. as an awareness piece, I think, back in 2008. The second book, if there were a second, if there were a follow-on book, it would be, Here's how we transform the organization, the, the interlocking uh, practices of hundreds and even thousands of people. People who are just starting a business, people who are just starting in a leadership role within an, a smaller team, this is a really good start. As Art noted, like it's a really good starter book to get you at least aware of the fact that this is a problem. I would disagree that this is a well-known thought. I think that there are so many people on the planet who still believe that multitasking, because of the cultural, the, the moray that somehow doing more in less time means doing multiple things at once to get more done is truly productive when we have to balance out both time management and quality management at the same time. And these just are intrinsically connected. And we, we just tend to still believe that somehow people should be rushing from meeting to meeting, that busyness is actually business. 
and that's not true. And while we're all speaking to the choir, we're preaching to the choir here, the reality is, is that beyond us, that message has dissipated very, very quickly. There are so many more people who I think need this message. And so we have to, in some way, shape, or form, kind of continuing the religious metaphor here, we have to proselytize the message of the myth of multitasking as best as we can, which for me is like, I don't care about debunking myth. I care about modeling focus. And so really what we should be talking about is how do we show people that focus matters and focus makes a difference? And I see so many people fragmented Mm -hmm. and stressed out because they're fragmented, right? Your brain is doing more work than it needs to, and you'll get more done just Mm by doing less cognitive work. You will actually create more output and it'll be higher quality, and it will create less downstream problems for the people around you. So these are the things that we have to keep pushing in terms of messaging. Those of us who are interested in being productive ourselves, if we are in an interdependent world, we are affected by everybody else's lack of productivity. And so we need to make sure that we are bringing those people to the table. And that means opening the dialogue and just introducing them to these concepts. And if we could do that over and over and over again, um, hopefully we'll we'll see end results. So thank you, gentlemen, for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. We were discussing The Myth of Multitasking, the second edition by Dan Crenshaw. And with that, we are at the end of our bookcast discussion. The conversation doesn't have to stop here, though. If you have a question or comment about what we've discussed during this cast, feel free to visit our episode page on productivitycast.net. There on the podcast website at the bottom of each episode page, feel free to leave a comment or a question, and we're happy to read and respond to those there. By the way, to get to any Productivity Cast episode quickly, simply add the three-digit episode number to the end of productivitycast.net forward slash. So this episode is 125. So if you go to productivitycast.net forward slash 125, you'll be taken to the episode page for that episode. Also on productivitycast.net, you'll find our show notes, our transcripts, which are both readable on the page as well as a downloadable version in PDF. If this is your first time visiting, feel free to like and subscribe and rate the podcast if you're able to in all of the places, including your podcast app of choice. And if you have a topic about personal productivity you'd like us to discuss on a future cast, you can visit productivitycast.net forward slash contact, and there you can leave a voice recorded message from that page. And you can also type a message into the contact form, and maybe we'll feature it on a future episode. I want to express my thanks to Augusta Pinaud, Francis Wade, and Art Gelwix for joining me here on Productivity Cast this and every week. You can learn more about them and their work by visiting productivitycast.net as well. Click on their name or the about page, and you'll be taken to their information. I'm Ray Sidney Smith, and on behalf of all of us here at Productivity Cast, here's to your productive life. That's it for this Productivity Cast, the weekly show about all things productivity, with your hosts, Ray Sidney Smith and Augusto Pinaud, with Francis Wade and Art Gelwicks.